Good morning. It is good to be with all of you today, uh, especially for myself. After uh, spring break for our family, we're away uh, for last Sunday uh, in New York uh, visiting family and my wife's grandma, who is now 95 uh, years old. So we praise God we were able to uh, see her. Uh, On another note, um, this coming week, uh, I will be going on sabbatical for one month. Um, So it's actually been 15 years since I've been here on staff. Isn't that amazing? Um, Time goes by very quickly. And our conference is very gracious to mandate two-month sabbatical every five years of service. So I'll be taking one month uh, beginning this week. Um, So I'll miss all of you uh, dearly, but look forward to that time of rest. And thankful that we have a wonderful and amazing team, uh, Pastor Josh, Pastor Scott, Pastor Brian, uh, and also included in that great team is one who is now retired, and we're going to be celebrating Stan uh, later on today. So hopefully um, you are here this morning, and you'll come back later for the celebration in time uh, to remember uh, Stan and all that he has uh, done for the Lord and for our church. Uh, And if you forgot to wear plaid, that's okay. Um, Go ahead and and grab a plaid shirt too. Um, So in honor of of you, Stan, we're so grateful uh, to to be able to share in this day. Well, uh, today we are continuing on in our time in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah in our series called Restoring God's Kingdom. And we are coming toward the end of this book, uh, and there's so many amazing truths and hopefully so many great lessons that you've learned and how God has shaped you uh, in your life. And so we are in Nehemiah 9, and Uh, Before we go into the word of the Lord, let's go to to him in prayer this morning. Let's pray. God, we come humbly before you because you are our God. You are a magnificent God. You are a holy and perfect and righteous God. You are a creator God. You are a God who is a covenant God and is faithful to keep his promises. You're a God who redeems his people out of slavery and out of sin. You are a forgiving and gracious God, one that we don't deserve, yet by your gracious hand, we get to know you, we get to walk with you and have a relationship with you. And help us to confess that this morning. God, maybe it's been hard to walk in this journey in faith, help us to have faith. Or maybe we are um, hindered by our own sinfulness or selfishness or stubbornness and you would humble us today. Or maybe we find it a hard time to be in the word of God and so would you help us, God, to dedicate ourselves as the Israelites did to your word. Help us this morning to hear from you In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, as I began our time mentioning that our family was in uh, a way, and we are in New York City, uh, the Big Apple. And if you've ever been to uh, the Big Apple and see New York City, you might see a few of of these. Any seen of those? Yellow taxi cabs. And uh, we were uh, riding a few of those and Uber drivers uh, throughout the city in our time there. And while we were riding um, in one car, the Uber driver was honking his horn pretty loud, um, and he actually said this. He said, "Uh, you've got a horn for a reason, so you might as well use it, as he was honking at the cars in front of him. And certainly uh, throughout New York City, you can hear honking all the time, day and night. Uh, It is nonstop. People are in a rush to go uh, from place to place. Well, as I thought about what this Uber driver had said, it made me think about the church and um, the church on many different issues. Because if we apply to the American church, the big C church, it might sound this way. You've got a voice for a reason, so you might as well use it. You've got a voice for a reason, so you might as well use it. Or it's a free country, So you might as well let people know how you feel or what you believe, especially on certain topics. 
I believe these are some of the thoughts and feelings that have seeped into the church, the big church today, maybe not necessarily here, but uh, these voices and conventions have, can be heard very often, but sadly, people don't really hear what needs to be heard. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, I believe rather than hearing the gospel in its fullness, people hear a false gospel, like the prosperity gospel. Rather than hearing an admittance of sin and wrongdoing, people hear a justification for sins and wrongdoings from the church, especially church leadership. Rather than hearing what the word actually says on core matters or core beliefs, people hear only views on politics and pre presidential candidates and party lines. At moments, I think the confessions of the church have been lost because we, the church, have become trigger-happy to lesser confess confessions. And we've honked our horn on certain things that are lesser than the things that really matter. I'm not saying, as Christians, that you shouldn't have an opinion on politics or presidents or party lines. But what I am saying is that we should have a richer and stronger and even more opinion on the essential imperative confessions of our faith. This deep concern and challenge leads us to this essential and big question for today. What ought to be the confessions of the church? What ought to be the confessions of the church? What shall God's people confess? What shall God's people be known for? And so let's answer this imperative question with the first confession. We will admit our sins and not justify them. God's people of the church ought to admit our failures and our wrongdoings before we point fingers at the world. The church should be humble to confess its mistakes, especially around the areas of abuse and neglect. If you have your Bibles, look at Nehemiah 9, verse 1 and 2. Uh, some context at this point in the story, the rebuilding of the wall is finished. Nehemiah has retired from the scene. His duty is done. Like our brother Stan, the man is retired. So Nehemiah is retired now. And Ezra comes back onto the scene to facilitate the spiritual renewal of the people. So Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 1. And now on the 24th day of this month, the people of Israel were assembled with fasting and in sackcloth and with earth on their heads. And the Israelites separated themselves from all foreigners and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. Previously, Ezra read the law on day one of the month. And it was almost an entire month that uh, people have come with some unfinished business. And I appreciate the author's note that they uh, took some time to have their confession take residence in their heart. It's the 24th day of the month now. Hopefully this is an encouragement for all of us. If we're slow to respond to God or the church is slow to respond to things, that God is patient and God's people might come around. The people confess uh, their sins and come to their senses in a very serious way and they gather together in fasting and in sackcloth. That's very interesting because we don't generally think of those things in church uh, today. We think of fasting as some nutritional value like dieting or intermittent fasting. But fasting is a spiritual sign of denial to understand one's need before God and, and one's sinfulness and depravity. And next, sackcloth was traditionally made of goat's hair. It was a very uh, coarse and hard material. It represented humility. And so they come humbly before God. And the third thing we see here is that God's people put earth on their heads. They had dirt on their heads. Can you imagine that coming today? Uh, you came to church and you put dirt on your head. It seemed kind of silly, but this too was a sign of humility and a need for cleansing and purification. Beyond the physical sense is more importantly spiritual conviction of their hearts. On the outside, we see spiritual humility. Now on the inside, we hear about their spiritual humility and their actions. The Israelites separated themselves from uh, their unholy marriages and unions and they have come confessing their waywardness and their sinfulness in a very public manner. And what I appreciate about what they do here is not do they only confess their own sins, but they confess the sins of their ancestors as well. They profess their personal sins and their corporate sins. They do so by dedicating this day in confession to the Lord. 
Think, what if the church did that today? On May 2nd, the American church celebrates the National Day of Prayer. Do you realize that? You've heard of that before. On that day, the church prays for different people groups around the world. The church prays for its leaders, the denominations, and political leaders. But rarely do you ever hear or see the church confess their present sins and past sins. What a day might that be? What a day of healing that might be as well. What a testimony that might be that we might acknowledge that the church is not perfect, The church has sinned, especially church leadership and abuse. Sadly, we think of names, more recent names like Bill Hybels, Mark Driscoll, Ravi Zacharias, Carl Lentz, or past names, maybe like uh, Jimmy Swaggart or Jim Baker in those generations, or the Catholic Church as well. The church and church leadership have abused people, especially women and children. It should never, ever be the case. As a pastor, I am deeply sorry if you have been hurt by the church in any way, especially abuse or sexual misconduct. It grieves my heart that every time I hear another incident or another fallen pastor abusing his power, especially when church should be a place of security and safety. And so it is so horrific and horrendous because of bad leadership has done to so many people. It has robbed God of his glory and his namesake. It has killed the testimony of Christ. And I pray the church will be a place where we do confess our sin, where we are transparent and we don't hide it and we don't abuse sin either. And I pray for us, San Lo Church, that this passage, as we look at the first two verses, it might be a mirror or a warning sign to each of us too that we would take our sin seriously before sin kills us or before our sin destroys the lives of others in our community, in our marriages, in our families, in our, in our church even. I pray if you're wrestling with some sin here right now today, I pray that you know that you can come honestly before God and his throne and not receive condemnation or judgment, but you can receive grace and mercy. Not because of anything you've done, but because of the work of the cross of Christ. I pray that we might see our sin for what it is and confess it to God and confess it to one another as well. That's the first thing that we see. What ought to be the confessions of the church? Number one is confession of sin. To have a humble and contrite heart before God before Jesus Christ. The second confession is that we hold to the word of God and not our own words. We will hold tightly to the word of God and not our own words or opinions. We will let the word of God do the talking. We'll surrender and swallow our own wills and opinions for his word and let the word of God speak for itself. Look at verses three and four. And they stood up in their place and read the book of the law of the Lord for uh, their God for a quarter of the day. And for another quarter they made confession and worship the Lord their God. And the stairs on the Levites said, Jeshua, Bani, Kadmiel, Shebaniah, Buni, Shirabai, Bani, and Chishanai. And they cried out with a loud voice to the Lord their God. After they make a confession of sin and the sins of their parents, they stand up and they read the book of the law, the Torah. It is the word that takes center stage in their gathering as it should in the church today. And it says they read the word for what? A quarter of a day. That's a long time. Six hours. Okay, everyone's going to take out their planners or their um, calendars and we're going to be here until five or six o'clock. You okay with that? Stan, we'll push your back, celebration back a few hours. Okay. And they didn't stop there, Right? It says that they uh, then, for another quarter of the day, made confession and worship. So we're going to be here until the sun goes down. This was a wild and crazy scene, but it was a true revival, what true revival looks like. And we might think of what happened uh, last year at Asbury College, right? There's a revival that took place for two weeks. They continued to worship the Lord again and again. Certainly, it can be a challenge in our world today to uphold the word of God, especially in a university or academic setting. And this is why I deeply appreciate my alma mater and school, Biola, and their president. Uh, Here he is, um, Dr. Barry Corey. 
I was listening to uh, Dr. Corey uh, in an interview this past week, and his tagline was this, firm center and soft edges. Firm center and soft edges. At Biola, they hold to a, a firm center on the word of God and the gospel, but they have soft edges on how they love other people. And listen to what uh, Dr. Corey said uh, further in the interview. He said, in California, you have to take a different approach. So first, I like that we're holding uh, to deep convictions on the way God intended things to be an abiding truth of Scripture, and I want students to live that way and to hold to what they uh, believe to be true from the Word of God. And then he said, soft edges, meaning living lives that are winsome, that are gracious, that are hospitable, that are kind-hearted, where we listen to those who uh, might not think like us, believe like us, vote like us, or look like us. I agree with Dr. Corey. I believe uh, if you hold to the word of God, you'll see for yourself that very thing, a firm center and soft edges. I appreciate Biola's convictions around the word of God and their deep love for others in the world. And so what, is, what are the implications uh, for us, for the church and for us as believers? Well, one example is the word of God is not going to specifically tell you who to vote for. The Bible is not going to say, you shall vote for Biden or you shall vote for Trump. It doesn't say that. You can look at every single verse. But the word of God will give you principles on who to vote for and help guide your vote. The word of God will also tell you that God is in control of this presidential election. And additionally, Romans 13 says that everyone must respect their governing authorities. That the word of God does say. God inform, God's word informs us and challenges on all these issues from abortion to marriage to climate control to immigration. The word also lets us know that he values every single life created from the unborn child to the hurting child in a war torn country to the foster care child on the street. God's word is neither Republican or Democratic, blue or red. It is clearly about one ruler, the Lord of Lord and the King of Kings who reigns supreme. In Colossians, one helps us see that Christ is the supreme ruler over creation, the church, and recreation. And so then Christ must be the most thought of, most spoken thing that we say in this coming election and in every single sensitive issue. So let me pause for a moment. Let me kindly and lovingly challenge you this morning, Sanlo family, if you are discouraged by all that you see in this world or you are uncertain about a certain uh, issue or topic, go to the Word of God. Dig deeper into the Word of God. Get into it. Let me encourage you to fall in suit with our Israelite brothers and sisters who spend a quarter of their day reading the Word of God. Not just Sunday morning, not just the time that you sip your coffee in the morning. Let me plead with you to read the word of God consistently and vigorously. For this, this book is where our heart ought to be and what the, word, uh, the world definitely, desperately needs to hear from the word of God, not from our own mouths, so that we have a firm center in life and that informs how we live. Amen? so that we church might confess more and more of Christ, that we might be more biblically minded than uh, politically minded, sorry, because our biblical knowledge informs our political knowledge. And just as important, our biblical knowledge will help us know how to treat others, especially those that are different than us. And let our sound bites be anchored in the word of God with grace and respect. So far, we've answered the question, what are the confessions of the church? The first confession is a confession of sin. The next confession is a confession of the word of God. And the third and, and final confession that we'll see this morning is the gospel. We will testify to the gospel, not our own preferences. We will be rock solid on the truth of the gospel and God. Let us herald uh, and declare more and more the glories of our God than the glories of man or this church or that church. Look at verses 5 to 17. 
This next section is a, is a prayer of confession. It is understood as a historical confession, meaning it's sort of retelling the life of Israel and its history and what God has done, and it recounts the character of God and uh, the imperative confessions of our faith, and I'll summarize that shortly in a little bit. But again, I encourage you um, to read, we're only going to look at verses 5 to 17, but there are a ton of verses after that. It goes all the way to verse 38. And so again, this afternoon, this evening, um, in that quarter of your day, spend the rest of your time looking at these verses. Let's read verse um, 5 to 17 together. Then the Levites, Jeshua, Kadmiel, Bana, Hashbin, and I, Sherabai, Hodai, Shibanai, Pethin, Hayo, said, Stand up and bless the Lord your God from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be the glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. You are the Lord, you alone. I want you to see that every time it talks about you, it's referring to God, and, and the writer does that significantly throughout this. You have made the heaven and the heaven, the heaven of the heavens with all the hosts and the earth and all that is on it, and the seas and all that is in them, and you pre- preserve all of them, and most of the heavens worship you. You are the Lord, the God who chose Abram and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans and gave him the name Abraham. You found his heart faithful before you and made him the covenant to give his offspring in the land of the Canaanite, Hittite, Amorite, Perizzite, Jebusite, Gershite, and you kept your promise, for you are righteous. And you saw the affliction of our fathers in Egypt heard their cry at the Red Sea and performed signs and wonders against Pharaoh and all his servants and all the people of his land. For you knew that they acted arrogantly against our fathers and you made a name for yourself as it is to this day. And you divided the sea before them and so they went through the midst of the sea on dry land and you cast their pursers into the depths and a stone into mighty waters. And by a pillar of cloud, you led them in the day, and by a pillar of fire in the night to light for them the way in which they should go. You came down on Mount Sinai and spoke with them from heaven and gave them right rules and true laws and good statutes and commandments, and you made known to them your holy Sabbath and commanded them comm- commandments and statutes and the law by your By Moses, your servant, you gave them bread from heaven for their hunger and brought water for them out of the rock of their thirst. And you told them to go and to possess the land that you had sworn to give them. Let's stop there. That's a lot, right? I know. Um, And we could go on again to the rest of the passage. But with the time that we have, we're going to try and break this down section by section. And so that we can walk away with deep convictions on what we believe at the same time, hopefully significant challenges to how we live out those beliefs. And so I created this chart, hopefully to help you uh, in understanding that. And uh, it's very important to understand our theology of God informs our faith and actions and critical that we have a robust, robust theology so we can have a robust Christian life. And as you look at this chart, Um, Again, we're just going to highlight a few of the verses. We're going to highlight a few of the confessions of faith. And then um, the applications don't show up very well. Sorry about that. Maybe we'll try and correct that um, during the time in between services. But um, what I want us to see on this chart is um, obviously Nehemiah 9. And as it highlights um, the verses uh, there. And then the confessions of faith where it highlights um, the character of who God is. And then the applications of uh, faith. Again, hard for you to see some of those. Sorry about that. And if you look at this chart, though, I want to uh, make it clear is that you fo- we focus on the confessions of faith with our God. These are the main things that we want to focus on. And a lot of times what happens in the church today is we end up focusing on uh, the applications so much 
and so many times, which are usually the issues around many of these things. And if we focus just on this side of the line, uh, a lot of times what happens then is we end up leaning in toward like a social gospel or social mentality, and we lose sight of the gospel, which is really the main thing, and we lose sight of our God. Uh, and the other thing is if we just focus on all the applications, man, we're going to be overwhelmed because there are so many applications, so many issues, so many causes in this world. And so if you're looking at this chart and trying to figure out, well, where is God leading me in all these things? Just pick one. That's my suggestion. Because it can be very overwhelming. And again, focus on God. Focus on Him. That's what really matters. As you look at Nehemiah 9. And so again, the first part is that we see that in each of these points, I underline, you, you are the Lord, you alone. You made the heavens. You are uh, the ones who saw affliction of the fathers. You are God ready to forgive, gracious um, and merciful. It is all about God. That's the first point. God is in a class all by himself. There is no one in comparison to him. And the writer uh, begins that time by saying, you are the Lord, you alone. And the gospel begins and ends with God. This might be contrary sometimes how we hear the gospel or how we want to hear the gospel, receive the gospel, that it is God about God's love for us. It is about God saving us. It is about God helping us. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. But if the emphasis is always on us, then we're missing something out. We're missing the gospel. We miss out on God and who the gospel is really about, God himself. The gospel is always about the good news of God first and then the good news that we receive the blessing that he gives to all of us. So I appreciate the author's intention here on emphasizing God and Yahweh and the good news of the gospel is God. And without God, there is no good news. Do you understand that? The next confession is of our faith that God is a creator. You have made uh, heaven and the heavens with all their hosts. Verse, uh, this verse points to Genesis 1 and 2, right? At the beginning of the time when God uh, made the heavens, he made uh, man and he made women and he made um, the stars and the earth and the animals and his prized possession was us created in the image of God. He made male and female with equal value and dignity. He made marriage between a husband and a wife in a complementary relationship and he creates us with eternal value. How does God as creator inform how we live out our faith? How does this apply how we treat people? Well, if God is creator and he made every single person with each equal value and eternal value, then we ought to uh, treat every person with great value, whether they are black or white, Asian or Latino. We must care about how people are treated in this world. We must re respect people and how they view themselves, their gender, and what pronoun they might use, whether we agree with them or we don't agree with them. Our confession of faith requires us to be respecters of people because we respect the God who made them. It doesn't mean that we agree with every choice or every decision or every view, but we love them because Christ loves them. So God is God, God is creator. Next, God is Redeemer. We recall what God had done with uh, Israel and God's people, and he saved them from the wicked hand of Pharaoh, and they were locked down in slavery. They were oppressed people. However, God redeemed them from slavery and the chains of Pharaoh, and uh, this is pointing to the redemption of God's people, and it certainly is a clear picture of the gospel for us. For example, we too were once slaves. We were slaves to sin. We were freed from the bondage of sin and Satan. We were redeemed and saved by our God to the cross of Christ. So now again, in application, how does this uh, re redemptive confession inform how we live? How do we apply God as redeemer to the world that we see today? Well, sadly, it is very easy to see that slavery still exists today. There is a modern version of slavery. It's called human trafficking. It takes place right here in the Bay Area and all over the world where men and women and children are forced into sex and slavery. We ought to care about that. 
We see hurting and neglected children in our streets, especially in the foster care system. You know that our family was convicted to act in faith to taking the little girl for a year and a half. And so maybe the call for you is, is to help redeem a child. We see oppressed and hurting people around the world in war-torn countries like Gaza and Ukraine. We ought to have compassion on those who are suffering and actively participating in some way, whether it's human trafficking, foster care, or the loss of innocent lives around the world. You see, the gospel and our Redeemer move us to act redemptively and courageously in our world, to have hearts for those who are oppressed. Our God is, is, a, our God, is God, he is creator, he is redeemer, and the last one, gracious savior. I think this one encompasses all of them and the firm center we ought to believe in, we should live out. Look at verse 16 to 17 as we finish off this portion of this passage. But they and our fathers acted presumptuously and stiffened their neck and did not obey their commandments. They refused to obey and were not mindful of the wonders that were performed among them. But they stiffened their neck and appointed the leader to return uh, to their slavery in Egypt. But you are a God ready to forgive, gracious, and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and did not forsake them. This is a clear reminder of our own disposition and depravity, that we're all sinners who need a savior. We're all stubborn rebels and rebellions, We've all been disobedient children, and we, because of our sinful nature, we want things for ourselves first. Sadly, if you don't understand that part of the gospel, then you don't understand the gospel. We need to understand our need for grace and forgiveness and love from our God. You need to know that you have sinned against a holy and perfect God, and you are a person who is separated from the love of God, and you desperately need his love. And then verse 17 again says, uh, the wonderful things of our God, that our God is a forgiving God. He has shown us grace upon grace. He has given you what you do not deserve with great blessing. At the same time, he has been merciful to withhold from you what you do deserve, judgment and punishment. And it says, God is slow to anger. I love that part. He is not some angry and vindictive God ready to throw down lightning bolts on you from heaven. No, our God is very slow to anger and he is very quick to forgive. And our God is abounding in steadfast love. He is full and overwhelmed uh, of overwhelmingly sending his love to us more than you can be loved by any person in this world. Now again, how are we to apply these things in our lives? How might we apply these uh, phenomenal attributes of God uh, in our lives as well? Well, if God forgives then you and I can forgive our politically incorrect friend, brother and sister in Christ. If God is gracious and merciful, then you and I can be gracious and merciful to those who think differently than we do. If God is slow to anger, then you can uh, be slow to uh, be angry with maybe that hard Trump supporter or that difficult Biden supporter. If God is abounding in love, then you and I can be challenged to love people that are hard to love, or you and I can be called to love someone who desperately needs love, like a foster care child, the unhoused person down the street, or those suffering around the globe. Here at San Lo, we, we desire to do this well, yet I believe this is an area of growth for us as a church. And this is something that we've said very often Uh, And you've heard us say this, we are conservative in our beliefs and we are liberal in our love. We are conservative in our beliefs and liberal in our love. Just as Dr. Corey said, a firm center and soft edges, we hold tightly to the word of God and the gospel. We want to major on these confessions of faith. We want to die on the word of God and we want to die on the gospel At the same time, we want to love everyone and love all people of all walks of life. We want to love the Republican. We want to love the Democrat. We want to love the poor person. We want to love the rich person. We want to love the LGBTQ person while holding firm foundations and convictions of our faith. 
Because if we don't, 1 Corinthians 13, 1 says this. If I speak in tongues of men and of angels, but do not love, I'm only a resounding gong and a clanging cymbal. If we have no love for God, we are a resounding guy. If we have no love for people, then we are a clanging symbol. And we are then like that Uber driver who is just honking and beeping its horn at people. And sadly, that's all that they hear. And if that's us, then our testimonies are empty, even though our convictions may not be. And people only hear secondary noises coming from our voices rather than the primary sound, the most beautiful and glorious sound of the gospel and of our God. This is what people must hear, not a beeping horn, so that we then, church, confess our sin, we confess the word of God, we confess the gospel. Let us be a church and a family that admits Our wrongs not justifies them. Let us be a church that heralds the word of God with a firm grip on his word and not our own. Let us be a church that loves every single person, the entire world, just as our Savior did. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the love that you've shown to all of us, a love that we don't deserve. Thank you that you are abounding in steadfast love. And as we sit here this morning, and as we've heard from you, maybe the Spirit is speaking to each of us and moving in our hearts, maybe toward a confession of sin. There's a sin that we are carrying and that we need to repent. We need to ask for forgiveness, and we would do that before you today. Lord, maybe the Spirit is moving in a heart to hold on to confession of your word, that we've been away from your word. and We can't even remember the last time that we, we read it for ourselves. And this morning you are asking us to recommit ourselves to being in the word of God. Maybe the Spirit is moving in our heart toward a confession of faith, toward active faith, uh, faith in action, to respond to a specific cause that we talked about this morning. Maybe we need to go and to love someone or, or to forgive someone this week. That we would confess the love of God to a world that so needs it. Lord, wherever we are, we thank you that you Continue to work. We thank you that your word continues to speak and that we are always loved by you and we are challenged then to love others. In Jesus' name, amen.